All right, so we're now live and recording. I did find uh, the commission on on Delta, so I'll uh, I'll talk to Jim tomorrow and see if we can get. Isabel, could you mute us uh, in the run up to it? Do you mind? Yes. If we catch is one chance that I catch that. Well, I was going to mute the translators because I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, voices are caring, I think. We'll get that fixed. We'll get it fixed. All right, there are nine attendees, so we're going to just wait until seven o'clock, everyone, so that we can let everyone join on their own time. All right, if everyone can see my screen, just give a thumbs up so I can know. Perfect, thank you. All right. Dawn has joined us. Start in two minutes, give again people some time. All right, it's seven o'clock. We're going to start. Um, if I'm glancing down, just because I'm looking at my notes. So, oops. So, for opening remarks, I would like to welcome you all to the public involvement session for the Fredericton Regional. Region Solid Waste Environmental Impact Assessment Registration 
for the proposed Fredericton Landfill Maximum Height Increase EIA project. The purpose of this session is to conduct public involvement as part of an environmental impact assessment EIA under the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulation Clean Environment Act for the proposed Fredericton Landfill Maximum Height Increase EIA project. This session is being hosted by the Fredericton Region Waste and Gemtech Consulting Engineers and Scientists Limited who are consulting on this project. My name is Isabel Wallet, and I'm a planner with the Regional Service Commission 11 Planning and Development Division. I'll be your moderator for this session. With me is Brett McCree and Brad James from Fredericton Region Solid Waste, a division of Regions Regional Service Commission 11, and Marco Civitili from Gemtech, your host for tonight. You'll see other um, panelists as well. There is also Don, the executive director of RSC 11, as well as translators. So we'll get into, oh, that was just the write up. Give it a second for anyone who wants to read it. And we'll skip right into the agenda. So we're going to look into, we're going to look at the purpose of the session. The, there's going to be a presentation given about the project, and then we're going to open the floor to the public to comment. So if you're having any technical difficulties with your internet or your technology, you can call via telephone by calling one of the following numbers. Montreal is the closest number, which is 1438-809-7799. The webinar ID is 882-3353-4275. And your webinar passcode was emailed to you when you signed up for this session. Sometimes you can have technical difficulties when you're trying to speak because your webcam might not have a good mic. Um, so then if that does happen, we encourage you to call in with your phone. So what is the purpose of tonight? So the purpose of tonight's session is to allow the public the opportunity to learn about the project and for interested persons to comment on the project. So now we're gonna go into the presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen so that Brett can share his and Gentech. So I'll also unmute, oops, I'll also ask to unmute yourself, guys. You have to do that on your end before you start talking. Uh, hi, so yeah, thank you, Isabel. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Fredericton Regional Solid Waste and Gemtech, uh, like to welcome everyone to this open house session as a part of the public consultation component of the environmental impact assessment for the proposed maximum height increase at the Fredericton Regional Landfill. Uh, this environmental impact assessment was registered uh, with the New Brunswick Department of Environment and Local Government in November of 2020. So as, uh, as, as uh, Isabel stated, uh, the, the purpose of this public meeting is to in inform the public of this project. Uh, we hope to communicate the, the benefits of the project uh, for, for all the residents of Regional Service Commission 11 and also address uh, their concerns. Uh, this acts as a forum for the public to communicate their concerns and it's a, a part of the EIA process. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a part of this process, all public concerns will, will need to be addressed. Uh, the presentation is gonna follow this uh, general format. So I'll hand, uh, I'll hand this off to, uh, to Brett McCray, the general manager of the uh, Fundy Region Solid Waste. Fredericton Region Fred, Solid sorry. Waste. Sorry. I knew it was going to be Sorry, Marco. Thanks, Marco. <laughs> uh, so we thought a good way to start the presentation would be a uh, sort of a general overview of uh, who we are as an organization. Um, 35 years ago, uh, 1986, uh, we were established under the name of Fredericton Region Solid Waste Commission. Uh, um, in 2013, uh, we changed our organizational name to Fredericton Region Solid Waste when we became a division of Regional Service Commission 11. And to be clear, uh, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, Fredericton Region Solid Waste is a public nonprofit entity. Uh, we are not profit driven, and uh, our goal is to act in the best interest of uh, the communities that we serve. Uh, 
our service area covers an area of approximately 125 kilometers in radius. And so that's about 125 kilometers, give or take, in all directions from Fredericton. Uh, and we serve a population of approximately 142,000 people. Uh, our real purpose uh, is to provide waste management services, and that includes disposal and uh, recycling services to the 12 municipalities and the numerous local service districts that are the member communities of Regional Service Commission 11. Marco. Thanks, Brett. So uh, a little explanation about the project and what's being proposed. Uh, so as, as stated by Brett, the Fredericton Regional Landfill opened in uh, 1986 and uh, uh, it became a regional landfill in uh, 1993. Uh, that it began accepting waste from the entire Fredericton region. Uh, there's currently enough capacity at the landfill to operate until about uh, 2043, and that is without this proposed uh, height change. So the, the project itself uh, that we're looking to uh, get approval for is uh, to increase the height of the landfill from uh, geodetic elevation, uh, 59 meters, to a maximum elevation of uh, plus 88 meters. Uh, this project does not increase the footprint or area of the landfill. Uh, it will maintain current slopes and uh, uh, and it will also cap or cover an old section of, uh, of the landfill. Uh, this proposed change would provide over 2 million cubic meters of, uh, of storage and would extend the uh, current landfill site by about 17 years. The change would uh, would also reduce construction and capital costs for the landfill, which will benefit all users of the of the landfill. And uh, you know, it's not really considered a, a landfill expansion. Uh, it's going to have the same footprint uh, uh, as the current landfill, and uh, the area serviced by the landfill would would stay the same. And uh, an increased annual tonnage of waste uh, to be received at the facility is is not anticipated because of this project. Uh, this slide just uh, kind of gives a little context for the location of the landfill for, for everyone here. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, located within the boundaries of the city of Fredericton. Uh, to the east of the landfill is uh, Highway 7, and it's accessed via Allison Boulevard. Uh, the closest residences are located uh, to the southwest on uh, Wilsey Road and to the southeast uh, in Lincoln Park Gardens. Uh, these closest residences would be just over a kilometer away from the landfill. Uh, the closest uh, residence to the northeast would be the Lincoln Heights neighborhood, and that's about two kilometers away. Uh, the highlighted yellow area represents the um, actual area of the landfill uh, that waste is, uh, is contained in, uh, where waste is deposited, the footprint of the landfill. Uh, and that would not change uh, with this project. That would stay the same. The hatched yellow line uh, around the landfill represents a two kilometer radius from the center of, uh, of the landfill cell areas. Uh, so this next slide is a little bit closer up view of, of the site. Uh, it shows uh, some of the other infrastructure. So to the north of the uh, containment cells, you've got the leachate pond, the sedimentation pond. Uh, and to the south, you've got the uh, administration buildings, recycling facilities, and bailing facilities. Uh, there's several different color highlighted areas here. Uh, areas A, B5, and C are future expansion areas for, uh, for uh, containment cells. Uh, they're not currently, uh, no cells constructed in this area that would be, be used in the future. Uh, area B, the blue shaded area, is a modern, uh, engineered landfill. Uh, it's got uh, cells there uh, up to uh, build up to elevation 59 meters approximately. And these were built and, uh, and utilized in the 2000s. Area D, the large green area, uh, is uh, filled with municipal solid waste uh, between uh, 1986 and, and the early 2000s. Uh, it's old landfill area. Its current elevation is between uh, plus 40 and plus 59 meters geodetic elevation. 
the new cells that are currently being used at the site, the E cells, are, are actually built on top of this area. They're just uh, shown uh, with the black hatching there. And uh, uh, this, this E cell area uh, has an engineered liner and, and modern leachate collection. Uh, this plan also shows the extensive network of, of sampling sites for the landfill. Uh, there's over 56 water monitoring uh, sites that are sampled uh, regularly as a part of the uh, uh, landfill's uh, operation and reporting to the Department of Environment and Local Government. So just a little, we talked a lot about geodetic elevation, I guess, in this presentation. So we just want to give a bit of a uh, explanation. Uh, what that really means. So uh, uh, geodetic elevation refers to uh, mean sea level. So the current height uh, approval of the landfill allows uh, waste to be deposited up to plus 59 meters. Uh, the proposal that is uh, uh, put forward to the Department of Environment is to deposit waste up to elevation 88. That's an increase in uh, 29 meters or about 95 feet. Uh, this does not mean there will be a, an 88 meter high uh, mountain of uh, uh, waste. Uh, the elevation uh, of the, the landfill property surrounding its cells is, a, is approximately plus 30 meters uh, geodetic. So the landfill uh, area will be about uh, 58 meters uh, uh, high, higher than the surrounding area. Uh, the slopes of the landfill uh, with this proposed change will, will remain the same. They're sloped at four horizontal to one vertical for long-term stability of the waste. And uh, due to this sloping requirement, uh, only a small uh, amount or area of the total landfill area will actually eat, reach elevation 88 meters. Um, this can be kind of shown on the next slide. Uh, it's just a 3D rendering. Uh, the light orange uh, area would be what the landfill would look filled up to elevation uh, plus 59. The dark orange area would, is the additional volume um, so that uh, would be filled up. That's what it would look like once it's filled uh, to capacity, uh, you know, as in the future. So as you can see, uh, with the four to one slopes, uh, the only area that will, will really be above the uh, 59 meter mark is that uh, uh, D cell area and a little bit of, uh, of the C cell area. And as, as it shows here, that again, it's going to extend the length of life of about uh, about 17 years. Uh, this next slide is a bit of a video. Uh, it's a drone video, and it's kind of give a bit of a perspective view from uh, the top uh, of the proposed landfill height. So it starts at the current uh, landfill height of plus 59 meters and goes up to plus 88 meters and kind of spins around. So I guess as you're as you're viewing the video, the things to notice, I mean, it's a you know the, the cleanliness of the site. It's it's not like the uh, old dumps of the past. This is a this is a clean, maintained site. It doesn't look a lot different than any other construction site you'd see. So, uh, right now we're viewing over some uh, prepared area of future expansion on top of the D cell area. Um, yeah, the uh, the I guess the active area was, was uh, when we first went up. It's relatively small compared to the entire landfill area. Uh, the, the entire size of the landfill. And I guess another thing to observe as we're, as we're panning around is, is you can't see any of the nearby residences. Uh, so that is a good indication that those residences uh, uh, won't be able to see the, uh, the top of the uh, finished rate of the landfill when it's up to the 88 meter mark. Um, and I guess another thing to note is this video was done in the, in the fall when uh, there's the least amount of uh, uh, foliage to, uh, to block the view. So should be a good indication that uh, that there shouldn't be a whole lot of uh, views opened up to the to the landfill with this change. So I'm going to hand uh, hand this back to Brett to speak of the benefits of the project. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Margo. So uh, that was a a good overview of the engineering side of the uh, the project and the uh, technical details. Um, but I want to talk about the benefits to the communities and the residents that we serve. Uh, the first being uh, what Marco had already mentioned, which is an increased lifespan of the landfill. Um, a successful project application is going to mean that we're going to have an additional usable volume of approximately 2 million cubic meters. 
And what that means is we can expect an extension in the life of the landfill of over 17 years. Now, this makes a lot of sense uh, uh, from not only an engineering perspective and an economic perspective, but obviously it, it makes a lot of sense from an environmental perspective uh, uh, too. And when I say that, what I'm referring to is that it's gonna significantly delay the need to uh, site a new disposal facility in the region. Uh, we've already got an impacted site and uh, we uh, the best thing we can do at this point is to really maximize its utility. Go to the uh, next slide there. Um, the next group of benefits really stems from uh, um, extending the, uh, the utility of the existing infrastructure. And when I say that, I'm referring to the leachate collection system, the leachate treatment facility, surface water treatment pond, and our landfill gas management system, all of which can be used uh, for an extended period if, um, um, you know, throughout that additional 17 year period that uh, we would uh, achieve with a successful application. Um, all of these things lead to reduced construction costs, lower operation costs, and lower maintenance costs. And those will result in savings to the ratepayers. And so when I say the ratepayers, I'm referring specifically to the communities and the residents that we serve in our region. Next slide. And last but not least, <clears throat> we expect that this project is gonna result in significantly lower cell costs. Uh, and to explain that better, I really have to uh, uh, talk about piggybacking uh, cells. Now, piggybacking cells is the practice of building new cells on top of existing cells. And it's been standard practice uh, at FRSW for over five years. Now, there are a number of benefits that flow out of piggybacking cells. Uh, uh, Marco uh, mentioned a few of them previously, but um, some of the big ones are, uh, you know, uh, by constructing a new cell on top of an old cell, not only do you create a, a liner over top of the old cell to prevent any future infiltration of rainwater, uh, uh, by doing that, you reduce the amount of wastewater being produced through the cell or leachate. Um, it also acts as a cap to prevent uh, uh, gas escaping from the old cells. Uh, so we would expect there'd be a reduction in odor in the, uh, um, the existing uh, uh, cells that are up there. Again, those are older cells uh, with an older gas collection system in place. The new cells being placed on top would uh, have a, a more modern collection system with a higher gas collection efficiency. And of course, it results in savings. And those savings flow out of uh, uh, savings in liner costs and uh, uh, most significantly excavation requirements. See, a typical cell is placed at a uh, lower elevation and uh, usually requires extensive excavation. And I'll, in, the, in the next couple slides, I'll get to that. Uh, uh, you'll be able to visualize where we're planning on going uh, uh, should we not have a successful application, give you an idea of the scale of excavation required. But that savings from the, the um, excavation alone results in a dramatically lower cell cost. And when I say that, I mean, uh, uh, cell costs will be reduced by approximately a factor of 10. Um, the cell, for example, that we currently have planned for 2022 is expected to cost in the order of $2.3 million. Uh, if we're successful in our application, uh, the cell that we'll be able to build in 2022 uh, uh, is expected to cost about $230,000, so a factor of 10. And again, as Marco had mentioned, it would extend the, uh, the current expected lifespan uh, from uh, of the landfill from 2043 to uh, at least 2060. When I say at least, um, initially the, the landfill was expected to last until approximately 2036. Because of diversion activity, we've been able to extend that. And I would ex expect that in the future as new diversion initiatives take place, uh, uh, the lifespan of the landfill will be further increased. So, <clears throat> I wanted to show a couple of videos just to get a, give people a feel of our site. Most, most of the participants may not have ever been there. Um, but in the foreground, you'll see our gas utilization plant. It's a 2.1 megawatt uh, uh, facility. They were able to produce uh, um, enough uh, clean electricity to power over 2,000 homes. Um, in the center of the shot now, <clears throat> you're looking at the mountain 
for the large hill that uh, where we're planning to build our 2022 cell, should this application not be successful, you can get a feel. You can see the bottom of the hill on the left. All of that mass has to be excavated out. I believe the uh, the total amount of excavation work for the C cell areas is approximately two cubic kilometers. Um, it's significant and uh, obviously it results in some significant costs. Um, the last thing I'll point out I, uh, would be our active area. You can see it in the background in the center of the shot. We've got some new cells going in there, um, but that's really the area where you could expect a higher elevation in the, uh, in the landfill. Um, so again, what we're really talking about here is an increase in elevation in the center of our site. Uh, not around the perimeter, and we don't expect uh, to interfere with uh, sight lines for residential areas. So th the next video that we'll share with you is from the opposite perspective. So this video is looking from the south towards the north. Uh, in the foreground, bottom right, you can see our bailing and recycling facilities. Uh, uh, in the center of the shot now, in the foreground, you can see some of our supplies or stockpiling areas. I really wanted to show you this video for three reasons. Uh, the first being that it uh, demonstrates the uh, limit of waste that uh, Marco showed on one of his slides. Uh, it's roughly shown by the tree line that you're starting to see on the left-hand side of the uh, screen. So that's the limit of waste. That's where the four to one slope would uh, begin. And uh, uh, somewhere close to that uh, road that you see on the right-hand side of the shot is where we would start to uh, move up beyond the uh, currently approved uh, maximum height of 59 meters. The last thing that I wanted to point out uh, on this uh, shot is the cleanliness of our site. Of course, we're the only bale fill facility in the province. And uh, um, what that means is we bale our waste prior to placement, dramatically decreases the amount of uh, blowing debris on our site. Um, I just wanted to point out how clean the site is and uh, you can expect that trend to continue. We, uh, we take great pride in the uh, cleanliness, cleanliness of our site. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Vanderlaan. I'm an environmental regulatory specialist with GEMTAC, and I will be providing you with an overview of the environmental review uh, and approval, if you will, uh, framework that uh, is being utilized. And I'll speak a little bit about who is, who is managing and implementing these processes, what the authorities are under which these processes uh, apply. So uh, to start with, the Department of Environmental Local Government has been implementing uh, the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulation since 1987. Uh, the EIA process is, is a project planning instrument, if you will, for major projects. And the, the whole intent of that process is to, to uh, review uh, proposed projects and to ensure or to to, to uh, identify all the potential impacts associated with these projects and develop mitigated measures to reduce potential impacts to accept, acceptable levels or to avoid them altogether. So the uh, legislative authority uh, that the, that the uh, environmental impact assessment regulation um, is operating under is under the Clean Environment Act. It's the statute or act that uh, gives the, or it provides the government the authority to implement a process such as EIA. And the EIA regulation or the Environment Impact Assessment Regulation itself is the uh, instrument that outlines how that process is implemented. So it would specify certain requirements um, that would apply to project proposals uh, that are subject to EIA. In this particular case, uh, this, this project is triggered and therefore has to be registered under the EIA regulation because it is captured in Schedule A of the EIA regulation, which contains 26 uh, triggers. Those are essentially activities or projects that are deemed to be undertakings that could have a potential or significant impact on the environment. And if anybody wants to propose or carry out any of these activities, 
then the project would have to be registered. It, it would not only apply to uh, somebody want to develop such a project, but also if somebody had an existing facility that might have been in existence prior to the regulation coming into, into effect in 1987, and they want to significantly modify such a facility, the EIA trigger would be applicable as well. So in this particular instance, uh, this the, the, the project to increase the height of the landfill to 88 meters was deemed to be was deemed to be a significant modification to the project, and therefore EIA registration was required. One thing that should also be pointed out: uh, the minister has the authority to uh, ask or request any information that he or she deems necessary to make a decision. And one of the things that the Department of Environment has implemented since about 2004 is that uh, any project that's registered uh, has, to be sub has to be subjected to public input and public review. And uh, this meeting is part and parcel of that, of that process. And, and this is your opportunity, as Marco pointed out earlier, uh, to, to basically familiarize, familiarize yourself with the process, with the project, and provide us with your comments. And then we uh, will submit a summary of all those comments back to the Department of Environment uh, at the conclusion or towards the conclusion of this process. So I will give a very high level overview, if you will, of the methodology that uh, was used to generate the EIA report. And again, this is from the perspective of you know, writing an EIA report that is submitted to the Department of Environment and Local Government. There's a whole other dimension to the EIA process that's administered by the department uh, by means of the regulation and I'm certainly uh, if any questions come on that we have people available to speak to that if needed but essentially and again this is very high level uh, the EIA methodology basically starts with the description of the existing environment which is a very key piece to the review uh, every EIA review is unique um, if one were to propose a certain development in an, in an industrial uh, park versus in a green field, you know, the existing environment would be uh, very different. And uh, we go through a process called scoping to figure out uh, what the potential impacts might be. And the existing environment is a very significant and uh, important piece of that. The second part is we, we overlay the existing environment by a description of the project. Uh, and then we start looking at what potential impact pathways might occur uh, as a result of developing the project. Um, we typically uh, cast the net widely. We would uh, look at any potential impact uh, to, to make sure that you know, the EIA review and report is inclusive. However, there is a, a process to make sure that you know, the actual impacts uh, are meaningful and that the actual project components uh, would have influence on that potential impact pathway. Uh, you know, the, the technical term for you know, that inventory of impacts is, uh, you know, we, we call all those features environmental components of concern. Uh, if in fact there is a, a source and a receptor, the source of uh, potential impact or a source of a concern and uh, a receptor that would be affected by that, uh, by, by a part of uh, the, the project or as part of the project component, then uh, further study will be done to identify mitigative measures for those features. And those features that require further study are uh, typically referred to as valued environmental components. And again, uh, once those are identified, mitigative measures are uh, employed or, 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 or determined to uh, reduce those potential impacts to acceptable levels or to avoid them altogether. So that's again, very high level uh, description of what the methodology is like. Uh, you know, there are there are people that have written PhD papers on this methodology. We could uh, have day seminars on this, uh, but this, you know, for 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 the purpose of this meeting, is a very high level overview. Some of you that are in the audience might very well be aware of that. Others may not. So we thought it was very important that that was uh, included. The, the last uh, aspect of, of this slide is, is if there were to be any uh, impacts that can't be totally mitigated, then uh, there is the opportunity to, to do 
uh, like compensation, if you will, to address any any residual effects that are deemed to be significant. And a typical uh, scenario that most people can relate to would be if there were an impact on wetlands, for example, and uh, not uh, not all impacts could be avoided. One could require uh, that open compensation uh, as a compensation or an offsetting mechanism additional wetland would be created to uh, ensure that there was no net loss of wetlands if you will so that's an example of how uh, if there were to be uh, a residual effect uh, a, a mitigative or a compensation measure could be employed to offset that residual impact so as i as i said the the uh, first initial phase of an EIA uh, preparation is the description of the existing environment is very uh, crucial and very significant and it has a huge impact on how the EIA is scoped or what features uh, of the environment would be in included in the uh, in the EIA review and you know, as was pointed out uh, earlier in this presentation we're dealing with an existing facility that has been in operation for uh, 35 years uh, that the the, pro the project is proposed is a is an increase in height on on the existing facility. There would be no uh, changes in the actual footprint of the facility. Uh, as a result, there are, for all intents and purposes, very few uh, potential impacts to uh, the natural habitat, the wild, wildlife habitat, or any other vegetation that might be in the surrounding area of the of the site. Uh, in, in, in the same line of thinking, there are no impacts on water courses. There is no proposal to uh, change any of the water courses or have any further uh, impacts to water courses again, because the uh, actual footprint of the facility will not change and it's going to uh, remain the same. And because the uh, facility has been in operation of uh, uh, for over 30 or for close to 35 years, uh, there is a, a track record of existing measures that they have uh, utilized to address uh, a lot of issues. Uh, they have a lot of experience in, 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 in implementing these mitigative measures and they will be continue to be implemented throughout the project should it be approved. Uh, so again, the, the, the existing environment uh, in this scenario is a, obviously an existing facility uh, that has been in operation for 35 years. And as a result, uh, you know, uh, the, the scope is much narrower than it would have been had it been uh, in a new facility at a new in a, in a greenfield site. So then we come at the, uh, at the the various aspects that were given further study, and those are the, the valued environmental components I referred to earlier. Uh, the most important one is in, in many people's minds might very well be the atmospheric environment, which would include uh, things like odor, uh, the air quality aspect of things. Uh, wind-blown debris, any of those aspects. So uh, additional study and additional mitigation measures were uh, evaluated for those, and Mark was going to uh, speak on those uh, after. Same for groundwater resources. Uh, again, this facility has been in place for, for many, many years. Uh, there's an extensive uh, regime of groundwater monitoring uh, activities that happen with the operation of the facility. Uh, and you know, as a result, uh, it was concluded that there were very little impacts on water resources, if you will, and Mark Morgan will, will speak to those further. Uh, as far as the ecological environment, which for all intents and purposes is the land-based uh, wildlife, if you will, uh, again, because it is a existing facility, the footprint won't change, uh, very little will be, will be affected off of outside of the footprint. And as far as uh, uh, the footprint itself, as we've seen in the videos, this is a, a managed facility where there's a lot of activity uh, you know, on the surface of that uh, facility. There's various activities going on on an ongoing basis. Um, as a result, there is very little opportunity for any wildlife to uh, nest or populate there. And again, due to that, uh, that scenario, it was concluded that very little impact would be uh, had on the ecological environment. The last stack that was evaluated in the EIA report is land use and economy. Again, this deals with issues of neighboring uh, businesses, uh, residential developments, uh, basically all land uses around the uh, facility. Uh, again, 
very few impacts are anticipated as a result of the increased height. Uh, the, the, the facility will you know, operate for a longer period of time if approved, uh, but as far as the number of tons shipped to the facility or uh, you know, the use of the existing infrastructure for all intent and purpose will not change other than the extended time frame. Again, uh, it was concluded that very few uh, impacts would uh, be generated as a result of that area. Back to Marco. Thanks, Paul. So uh, yeah, as Paul pointed out, there, there were potential impacts uh, identified through the EIA process. Uh, and we're gonna go in, dive a little deeper into some of the, some of the uh, ones that we, we identified. Um, and, and we're also gonna discuss the, the mitigation measures that, uh, that have been taken in the past and will continue to be, continue to be taken and, and further mitigation measures. So uh, uh, with higher elevation of the, of the landfill, uh, there's potential for an increase in uh, wind blowing uh, dust and debris. Uh, so when we looked at this project, you know, there's, there's a negligible difference in wind speed and atmospheric pressure. Uh, between the existing landfill elevation of plus 59 and, and plus 88 meters. Uh, so based on that, we, we it's, it's, it's not viewed that any of the mitigation measures that are currently employed by the by the landfill will be less effective. We, we anticipate these mitigation measures to continue to be effective uh, with these concerns. Uh, a lot of these mitigation measures for all the impacts are, are similar, but uh, I guess they kind of address multiple, multiple uh, multiple issues uh, and that's how they're, they're, they're used. So I guess for, for wind blowing debris, uh, mitigation measures that, that's used at the Fredericton landfill, uh, there's current ongoing monitoring and dust suppression measures are used uh, when required uh, on the access roads and, and in the construction areas. Uh, as Brett noted, uh, the, you know, the unique, unique feature of the Fredericton landfill is the mechanical bailing of waste. Uh, that uh, leads to less loose debris in the in the cell area. Uh, most of the waste that's deposited there is bale. Uh, it also compacts compacts the uh, the waste better as well. Uh, the landfill maintains debris fencing. They they maintain a double line, uh, and and this uh, fencing uh, will be expanded if needed uh, if additional debris is is noticed. Uh, they maintain a visual berm uh, on the east side of the site between the uh, landfill and Highway 7. And uh, the entire perimeter of the landfill has a vegetated, uh, mature vegetative buffer on the landfill property. So that will be maintained as well uh, to help mitigate wind, wind blow and debris leaving the site. Uh, the operation of the landfill, they, they're, they do a regular covering uh, to, uh, to limit the amount of waste that's exposed to the atmosphere. And uh, after a cell is uh, reached to capacity, they, they cap the cell. Uh, and that involves uh, capping it with different soil materials, geotextiles, and, and vegetation. Uh, and that uh, is a permanent cap that will uh, uh, create a barrier between the waste and, and the atmosphere. And another feature that the landfill has done in recent years is having smaller uh, containment cell size, uh, which further uh, limits the amount of uh, uh, debris that is open to the atmosphere. Uh, another potential impact that was identified is potential increased visibility of the landfill. Um, uh, there's uh, being constructed at a 29 meter higher elevation, you know, the landfill will be visible from, from more areas. Uh, as a part of our uh, analysis for this week, we uh, constructed several 3D models uh, within and beyond the assessment area. Uh, you know, there will, as stated, there will be some increased visibility of the, of the containment cells from, from highways, some local roads, and some open areas in the uh, Vanier Industrial Park. Uh, these areas are all generally uh, over a kilometer away. Uh, our analysis showed that, that it should not be visible from, from any nearby residences. And I guess our drone video, uh, the three drone videos also kind of showed that uh, uh, thanks to the uh, current uh, vegetation around the site, uh, it won't, uh, it should not be visible from any residential properties. So now further ways this, this will be, be uh, mitigated is the landfill uh, plans to maintain the vegetative buffer all around the perimeter of the landfill property. Uh, the way the cell is operated uh, helps to, uh, helps to mitigate visibility of the landfill operations as well. Uh, they typically fill and cover on the east side first. So that is the side of the containment cells that uh, would be most viewable to the most to the most residents at the along routes route seven. So uh, 
by filling and, and covering that area first uh, of, the, of the landfill cells, it creates a visual barrier. Uh, they're going to continue with sequential capping of, of filled containment cells, and that will create a vegetated slope. Uh, and uh, something that the landfill is considering and, and is looking to employ is to enhance the vegetation on the visual berm between the landfill and Highway 7. Uh, right now, the berm is covered with you know, grassy uh, vegetation, but they're look, looking into uh, uh, planting some mature trees to, uh, to provide further visual, a visual barrier along that side. Uh, third, the third potential impact that was identified uh, is, is groundwater and, and surface water protection. Uh, so uh, the increased uh, load and pressures of the increased garbage in the cells uh, will not affect the in integrity of the current liner or leachate collection systems. And these systems have proven to be effective over the life of the landfill, you know, since 1986. Uh, how do we know they're effective? By the uh, water monitoring, the extensive water monitoring and testing that's conducted uh, regularly on the site. Uh, and there's been no issues identified in the past with, uh, with groundwater or surface water uh, since the landfill has opened. And, and some of these monitoring uh, wells are you know, basically adjacent to the, uh, to the containment areas right up against them. Uh, but you know, mitigation measures, this stuff needs to be monitored and, and, and stuff. So uh, the landfill will continue and maintain the sampling and testing of the monitoring wells and surface water. Uh, surface water and underdrains are, are sampled monthly and groundwater is sampled and tested at least three times a year. Those reports are submitted to the Department of Environment and Local Government for review to ensure that uh, there are no issues. Uh, as the landfill uh, constructs new cells, the leachate collection system will be expanded. Uh, that will uh, collect more, uh, more leachate and, and uh, in the area that uh, uh, new cells will be constructed on top of the old cells. Uh, that will collect uh, uh, leachate that would would be you know in partially infiltrating into the old uh, old landfill area. So it should uh, it will enhance the the capture and uh, of leachate at the site. Uh, yes, they're also going to maintain the existing uh, collection and treatment facilities with of leachate, which includes the pond piping and and pumps. Uh, and in terms of accidental spills. And that sort of uh, potential for groundwater impacts. The landfill employs an environmental management plan, which covers measures for reporting and remediation of accidental spills. And that will continue. So another identified uh, impact is the potential for an increase in noise uh, and light emissions from the higher elevation. Uh, so one thing to note, there's, there's no planned new sources of light on top of the landfill cell. And uh, for noise, it's, there's a negligible difference in wind speed and atmospheric pressure, as, as stated earlier, between the two, the existing elevation of 59 meters and the proposed elevation of 88 meters. And I guess it's important to note that uh, the landfill has never received a complaint um, about noise or light from the public since, since the landfill has been operated by the uh, Fredericton region solid waste. Uh, so mitigation measures, again, uh, you know, the, the, the vegetated buffer uh, will help to mitigate, uh, you know, light uh, escaping the property and noise. Uh, their equipment that they use on the site is, is maintained and serviced regularly. They're, they're muffled uh, up to current standards, so that helps reduce noise. Uh, yeah, and, and at these higher elevations, there will be no new sources of light or, or noise. I guess it's also important to note that the limited hours of the, of the landfill help to mitigate this potential issue. They, they operate only during daylight hours, generally from 7.30 to 5.30, and uh, they're closed Sundays and holidays. And the last uh, potential impact that was identified is a potential increase uh, in odorous emissions. Uh, so as stated, the, uh, the, the wind speed and atmospheric pressure between uh, 59 uh, geodetic elevation and 88 geodetic elevation, uh, there's a negligible difference. And uh, what this uh, tells us is that the, the mitigation measures currently employed and, and that are effective at the landfill now should, should be uh, effective at the, at the additional elevation as well. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, there have been no complaints from the public in over three years over odors from, uh, from the landfill. So mitigation measures that are currently used uh, at the landfill, uh, they, they will continue with sequential capping of filled areas that uh, limits the escape of landfill gas, uh, which is the source of odors. Uh, the 
continued capping will, will help to capture those gases. Uh, as uh, shown on some of Brett's slides, there, the landfill has a landfill gas utilization system. Uh, this system is uh, uh, sized appropriately to, to take on more uh, landfill gas, uh, to, to take on additional uh, horizontal collection pipes and vertical wells in the new uh, landfill containment area. Uh, so uh, this, this system collects landfill gas and, and burns it, which uh, which uh, helps to destroy odorous emissions. And uh, there's been recent improvements in this system. Uh, a hydrogen sulfide uh, absorption system was installed and uh, hydrogen sulfide is, a, is a, one of the sources of odor from uh, landfill gas. Um, and again, uh, we talked about the smaller cell size reduces the area of, of waste that is open to the atmosphere. And uh, it was touched on briefly previously too, but uh, Building the new containment cells on top of the old landfill area uh, is an opportunity to reduce the landfill gas emissions from that area. Uh, the liner for the new cell uh, will also serve as a cap uh, to the old landfill area. So what this cap will do, it'll, it'll decrease the uh, water uh, that infiltrates into the waste, uh, which should slow down the decomposition of the waste. And it will also help to encapsulate those landfill gases in the old landfill area. Uh, so in terms of uh, the project uh, schedule and, and goals, uh, the uh, just a little summary here, uh, the EIA was submitted to the Department of Environment in November of 2020. Uh, we received the first round of, of questions from the Technical Review Committee uh, and, uh, and responded to those in January, just last week. And uh, we're anticipating further, further back and forth between the uh, the department and uh, and the landfill on this. Uh, public consultation is ongoing. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about other ways you can uh, uh, communicate your concerns, but but this open house is a part of the public consultation. Uh, so uh, that, that, that will continue uh, over the next several weeks as well. Uh, there's, as I said, there's additional rounds of TRC questions throughout the winter and spring of 2021. And uh, the target for final determination of the project is summer of uh, 2021, so this upcoming summer. Uh, if this project is successful and, and is given uh, permission to proceed, uh, Fredericton uh, Landfill anticipates depositing uh, waste uh, above the 59 meter mark in, in uh, sometime in 2023. I'm gonna hand, uh, hand it back to Brett McCrae. Yeah, thanks, Marco. Uh, so the last point I wanted to discuss is why your opinion is so important to us. Um, Regional Service Commission 11 serves all the municipalities and unincorporated uh, areas in the region. Like I said before, it's 12 municipalities and uh, every local service district. Uh, we provided waste management services and recycling services to all of our member communities for over 35 years. And we're 100% committed to transparency and uh, view this public consultation as an opportunity to improve the project. We genuinely want your feedback. Uh, if we have an opportunity to improve the project and improve uh, uh, the life of our, of our neighbors, uh, and uh, um, we, we certainly want to take advantage of that. And um, so that's why we're here tonight. We want to hear your sincere feedback. Uh, and, uh, and if there's anything we can do to improve our operations, uh, um, we're going to do it. Um, so with that, uh, I guess we'd be open to taking any questions that the public may have. Yeah, I can use, I'll uh, put my slide back up and I'll quickly, hopefully go through the, the procedure about the open floor before we start taking comments and questions from the public. So as the moderator, I will verbally prompt you when it's your turn to speak, either by stating your name or last four digits of your phone number. You will have three minutes to speak. A bell will sound when you have one minute remaining. Everyone can speak once. I'll ask that everyone mute all other audio before speaking and using multiple devices can cause an audio feedback. Please state your name and address. Speak slowly and be clearly as possible so that we can record your comment as accurately as possible. 
When it appears as though there are no further comments, I will ask three times if there are any further comments. If there are none, then the public involvement session will be finished. Um, obviously, in the perfect world, all questions could be answered, but that's unfortunately not the reality. So if you ask a question, you might not get an answer. It's um, nothing personal. All questions and comments are um, appreciated. And just be uh, respectful, please. Um, disrespect won't be tolerated. And um, you'll be warned once before losing your ability to comment and your three minute time will be revoked. So just let's all just be very polite to one another. So you might be asking yourself, how do you raise your hand to speak? If you've joined via your telephone, you can dial nine and that will raise your hand. Unfortunately, if you called in, you cannot lower your hand, but if you decide not to speak, just let me know and I will lower your hand for you. If you joined on your Android or iOS smartphones at the bottom of the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a little hand and you can tap that to raise your hand and tap it again to lower. If you joined on your computer on the web, there is a little hand at the bottom center of your screen. You can tap it once to raise and tap it twice, once more to lower your hand if you change your mind and don't want to speak. So again, if you're having any technical difficulties, the numbers are on the screen where you can call in, the webinar ID is at the bottom and your passcode was in the email that you received when you registered. The floor is now open. Please state your name and address and everyone has three minutes to speak. Uh, the first person that has their hand raised is Sean Hamilton. So I will allow you to speak and you have the floor for three minutes. I'll ask that you unmute yourself, Sean. Good to go? Yes, you are. Okay, the presentation was very well done and you're doing a great job moderating. Um, guys, I, I want obviously more than three minutes of your time at some point, but I will point out the elephant in the room and that is you folks are, are doing a great job, but you're still a stinky neighbor, okay? And um, I've been here for 19 years at 105 Good Homes Road I complained once, uh, some people came down to verify that there was no odor. So I think a lot of the reasons why you're not getting odor uh, related complaints is because people don't think that there's anything that's gonna ever be done, okay? And that's really what I'm getting from people that I've spoken to so far. Um, uh, in terms of, of a monitoring system for air quality, like it's literally right on the front of my face called my nose. And uh, I can still smell the odor from the landfill. Uh, I talked to Marco about it, uh, I think it was a couple of days ago. And um, I have a lot of concerns with you going up farther into the atmosphere. I believe that the odor is gonna be worse than what it already is for us in the community. I've lived through the pre-gasification system. It was not pleasant. I'm not looking forward to any more odors or additional odors. I know that you said that it could potentially be better because you'd be covering something up. I'll take what I know versus what I don't know. If you've got a system in place that is fairly expensive, then that's fine. We'll pay the extra. Um, I'm not looking forward to any more odors. I spent a lot of time outside and I deal with it. And uh, going for walks in the community, I deal with it. So, so I have one minute left? Yes. Okay. So um, in terms of something that I'd like to see moving forward is maybe the discussion of an organics program to probably help emissions, uh, odorous emissions. I like what you guys are doing with the site. I'm out there quite often. And uh, I was out there the other day. But if you're going to start, uh, I'll say a mountain of garbage already at the tree line, I'm not concerned with anything other than odor. And it is an issue now. And I don't want you to build on it and compound on it and ruin the quality of life or further impact the quality of life that we have here in Lincoln. Also, your public consultation is not wide enough. You need a much bigger audience. Like Lincoln Heights, you've missed. You've missed part of Lincoln Park Gardens. You really should start at the Wilsey Road and come all the way down to the Nevers Road. 
to talk about your project because right, thank you sean you your three minutes is up so sorry to interrupt you there no no that's all right i could have went on there for probably half an hour but anyway all thanks right, for your time you. and i i believe your presentation was good but uh i don't support it i don't support the uh the project at all perfect thank you for the comment sean all right if brett or um, wants a comment, you just have to unmute yourself and jump in. Um, next sure. up is, oh, uh, do you guys want yeah. to say something? Yeah, Isabella, if I could. And uh, yep. uh, uh, Sean, we appreciate your comment. Um, uh, I'm surprised to hear your experience with the odor. Uh, like I say, we haven't received any official complaints since uh, 2016. Um, and uh, I, I was sincere when I when I said in the presentation, you know, we. We fully expect uh, the area that we're talking about uh, 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 piggybacking uh, uh, new cells on top of basically entombing is an old area of the landfill with a, uh, a, a, a gas collection system that was added after the waste was in place. I, I think it's important to, uh, to emphasize that the, the systems that we integrate into our uh, uh, cells uh, now are very different. Um, uh, we integrate uh, extensive horizontal collection uh, uh, piping and uh, extraction wells at, uh, at stages throughout the cell uh, being filled. And it's much more efficient in collection. Uh, I do believe that the benefit is going to weigh the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the additional waste. And again, we won't be applying, uh, there will not be any more waste than what we normally accept. It will still be accepted at the same rate. Uh, but I do expect that we'll have a higher gas uh, collection efficiency. You mentioned organics programs and uh, uh, Sean, I just wanted to let you know, I mean, we're always interested in uh, uh, new diversion initiatives. We are actively looking into organics programs. Um, a lot of people, when they think of organics, they think of uh, centralized composting or windrow compost. Um, um, there are also other approaches uh, that we're quite interested in that uh, may be more complementary to our existing infrastructure like um, anaerobic digestion, something that's able to supplement our gas system and something that's less odorous, by the way, than a uh, traditional uh, centralized composting facility. Um, the last point I'd like to make, Sean, is that um, uh, if you do have an odor concern, please reach out to us. Um, uh, you mentioned that in, in past we sent people over. I was probably one of those people at the time. And uh, we do take a, a keen interest in it. And uh, uh, we really we really don't want to, to be bad neighbors. Um, if we can uh, come over there, the first thing we'll do is check the wind bearing and, and try to find if it's us that's the source or, or if, if it possibly could be something else. Uh, uh, but we're certainly open to the idea that it could be us. And uh, if we can improve things for you, we will. Thanks, Isabel. All right, perfect, Brett. So the next one to speak is Yvonne Roy. I will ask that you unmute yourself and you will have the floor to speak. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi guys. Uh, good brief. Uh, I think it was really informative and I think it's uh, good that we're living at a time where we can have panels like this uh, and information sessions from the comfort of our home. Uh, my opinion is uh, similar to Sean's. Um, I live at uh, 153 Garden Grove, which is about ho five houses in the two kilometer yellow perimeter line. And I can smell the dump. Uh, this, I can smell odors from the dump frequently when I go outside as well. Um, and when I first found out about this project, that was very concerning. And I kept hearing it referred to as a, a negligible increase in height. And I was just doing some rough numbers. 29 meter increase um, is about 50%. And to me, uh, 49, 50%. And to me, that is not negligible. So already with the amount that we can smell at times, because it's not always, uh, an increase in, in 29 meters, the potential for the the increase in odors is concerning. We got kids, we like playing outside. We don't want to, we want to be able to open our windows. We want to be able to enjoy our property. And 
eventually i'm a, i'm a military uh, person eventually i'll have to move i want to be able to sell my house too i don't want i don't want it to be so stinky that that's going to be a factor and turn people away so i also do not support uh, the project and i think i've basically covered my point which is all about the smell i the visuals uh, the environmental impact i i believe because the footprint isn't increasing, I believe that most of that stuff won't change. Uh, however, my concern is the odors and, and that's it. Great, right, perfect, thank you. I'm just going to ask Sean to please state his address. I uh, forgot to mention that we feel free to start talking. So I'll just ask that you unmute yourself and just state your address for the record, please, Sean. It's 105 Good Homes Road. Perfect. Can I get another three minutes? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Isabel, if I if I could yep. respond to uh, Evan's comment. Um, yep, go for it. it it's uh, yeah, it's Brett McRae here. Um, Evan, I, I I hear what you're saying, and I, I would say, what I said to to Sean um, sincerely, uh, uh, if uh, if you can smell it, um, if you would, we would appreciate it if you could call us and. Uh, um, and I say this not, not to put it off on anybody else, but it frequently when we have responded in the past, and like I said before, I, it used to be me that, uh, that went out. Um, there are other potential odor sources in the area, and that's not saying that it's not us. Uh, it very well could be, uh, but we wanna learn from you. And uh, if we're able to get into your neighborhood uh, on a day when you can smell it, um, uh, we might be able to improve things for you. Uh, so uh, that, that would be my only uh, comment. The, uh, the only thing I would add actually would be that I, I, I do believe that we're going to reduce the amount of fugitive gases by piggybacking on top of the old cells with low uh, gas collection efficiency. Um, uh, all the indications that we look at, uh, you know, that there isn't necessarily a correlation uh, or a strong correlation between higher elevation and increased uh, wind speed. I mean, you're looking at a probably the six percent based on our models. Um, um, I think that six percent increase in wind speed is going to be uh, is going to be outweighed by the benefits of uh, uh, permanently entombing the uh, the old cells. Uh, the, the, thanks, Isabel. Perfect. Thank you. So the next speaker will be Jacqueline Allen. I'll just ask that you unmute yourself and you have the floor. Hello, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I live at 134 Susan Drive in Lincoln Park Gardens. And I echo the two previous uh, respondents about uh, the smell in the community. And I'm, I've been here over 20, 21 years. So I can tell you that last summer was probably the worst uh, of any time that I've lived here. And I must say I'm guilty of not having called the landfill to express my concerns, but I sure will from now on. And um, uh, it really, for me, it's important uh, that the quality of life uh, here in the community is not affected by something like that, that can in the future be avoided by not increasing the height at the landfill. So uh, for that reason, I wouldn't support it as well. So that's all I have to say. Perfect, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, Isabel, uh, mm -hmm. if I can just respond quickly to Jacqueline, I, uh, again, I, uh, uh, I would encourage you to uh, contact us if you, can, if, you can, if you have an odor in your neighborhood, we'd like to hear about it. Um, the other thing I just mentioned briefly, uh, Jack, and you, you, you had said that the uh, this summer was the worst that you can recall. Um, I mean, we this has been an unusual year for us, no, no different than everyone else. And uh, um, I mean, full disclosure, we have had issues in, in bringing in technicians from out of province uh, uh, with uh, with the COVID uh, regulations and uh, complying with uh, public safety measures. Uh, it's specialized work. Um, it's done nationally, uh, and uh, um, 
uh, it, it, it takes longer to get response times uh, with the current uh, epidemic. So I, I just wanted to mention that to you and uh, uh, in, in the hopes that uh, they, that you can keep your spirits up and uh, certainly don't expect it to be like this again next summer. Hopefully uh, things are getting better for everybody. Thanks as well. All right, perfect. The next speaker will be Volodymyr Levet. Sorry about that. And I'll just ask that you unmute yourself and also please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, thanks, uh, Volodymyr Yevets, 5 Rebecca Drive. It's in Lincoln Heights. Um, thank you for the great presentation and for uh, going over all the subjects. Um, just backing up the three speakers <laughs> before, um, we do have the door. Um, to be fair, it's, uh, it's only on the hot days. Um, but yeah, the same thing. So um, if the project can be done with reduced odor, uh, I don't mind about it, but, uh, but that's the main concern. And um, if uh, you mentioned that, that you would like to have us contact you regarding it, um, if you can tell what's the best way to contact. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Isabel and uh, Vladimir, um, just give me a minute and I will get you a contact number when we do our next, the response to the next speaker. I'll have it for you. Okay. Thanks, Isabel. Perfect. So the next speaker will be Jermaine Pataki Terio. And I'll just ask that you state your name and address for the record and also unmute yourself. Hi there. Yeah, my name is Jermaine Patakaterio. I live at 28 Lee Drive in Upper King Square, which is nowhere near the landfill, but um, I'm in the, um, the area that's serviced by the landfill and I've always had an interest in the landfill. Um, my question, well, I guess I have several questions. One of them about the air quality was simply the fact that people had expected the landfill to close at a certain point, the people that are living in the area. And so this is an extension of that time frame. So they're going to be extending the amount of time that they're living with the smell. So that's, that's, that's already been clearly spoken about. My other concern was about groundwater because they mentioned in the, um, in the EIA in two different areas that there was exceedances of the Canadian drinking, uh, hold on, the Canadian you know, the groundwater, the hold on, drinking water quality standards. And, um, and then there was no talk about it again. And some of the, the, the elements that were noted in the wells were, you know, heavy metals. And I guess I'm wondering the, the fact that the, the landfill is going to be open longer, then there's a potential longer opportunity for the leachate to um, meander down towards the, um, in the neighboring homes and I'm wondering if they're all on on municipal water because I would hate for them to have contamination in their groundwater and then let's see anything else oh yeah I was kind of concerned that there wasn't um, a discussion about the birds for the the international airport given that that um, that is a public safety issue I know it talked about in the EIA that there was going to be discussion with the landfill I thought it would be I'm not sorry with the landfill with the airport authority but I thought it might be nice to have that in the EIA document since we are actually talking about public safety uh, in the event of a bird to strike with an airplane. Um, one of the other questions I had have already been answered. And then I did have a question about the, um, the, the EMP talks about a one in a hundred year, um, I think it was a said pond that um, that's how, how big it's been constructed. And given the fact that the one in a hundred years now with climate change, really probably closer to one in 20 year, um, might the, the sedimentation pond become increased in size or the Lee J pound. Are you guys confident that given the increase in storms that those two ponds will not overflow? Cause I understand that there was a year um, I'm, I was looking at an old Gleaner article and they were saying that there was a, a time when there was an almost uh, overflow of one of the ponds. Um, yeah, and pretty much that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Jermaine. So I don't know if Brett wants to speak. You're currently muted if you did want to speak. Yeah, I, I, you made it, Paul. Um, 
Uh, yeah, we, we acknowledge uh, your concern about the groundwater. It was uh, discussed in uh, the EIA report. There were some exceedances of uh, water quality guidelines, as you pointed out, but I think the EIA report also explains that and speaks to it in that those may very well and, and all likelihood would have been natural uh, occurrences. Uh, so they, they are not really uh, linked to the landfill itself, but to natural phenomena that are in the geology. And uh, as you probably know, this is not uncommon uh, to also occur in other problems, other areas of the province and not unique to the area where the landfill is sited. Um, as far as the um, uh, pardon, the birds was one concern there. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as the uh, uh, birds and impacts uh, on on uh, flight traffic, if you will, uh, we did have feedback from uh, the airport themselves. Uh, they have expressed no concerns with the project. It was also uh, forwarded to Transport Canada, who echoed the uh, feedback from. The airport and uh, confirmed they had no concerns either. I guess uh, this is Marco. I can speak to the uh, the sedimentation pond and, and the hundred year design life that was you know stated in the uh, in the EIA. Uh, you know that the pond was designed in accordance with the standards and practices at the time that it was it was built, and it's it's monitored uh, regularly. And uh, there's been no issues with uh, with the sedimentation pond and, and its operation. And if it is noted that. Uh, you know, increased sedimentation is being uh, is being released. Uh, you know, there'd be upgrades made to that facility. That's a part of the uh, surface water uh, monitoring uh, program. Uh, and as far as the leachate uh, leachate lagoon, it's been sized uh, appropriately. And uh, I think Corey, there's some re recent upgrades made to the facility through some uh, some pumps to to improve that system. Right, uh, Corey King's here with GemTech. Right, the, the the leachate pumping system to the city has been upgraded actually to just recently to to upgrade to three times its original capacity so it's 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 certainly has all the capacity it needs and and the force main system from leachate pond to the city system has actually been upgraded as well just recently so it's, it, it has plenty of capacity all right so the next speaker is Kristen mcknight i'll just ask that you um unmute yourself to speak as well as state your name and address for the record please uh, yeah, it's actually Brad McKnight. Uh, calling. Oh, sorry. No, uh, my wife's name is on it, but uh, oh, okay. 80 Rebecca Drive in Lincoln Heights. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you as well for giving us the chance to uh, to speak our mind and for you guys to, to collect more information. I, I think if you had done a survey of, of people in, in our neighborhood and, and one closer, um, everyone would admit that there's, there's days where you don't want to be outside because the smell is bad. Um, what I'm wondering is if has been done elsewhere where um, you know a similar height increase has been uh, implemented at a different landfill and whether there was any surveying or data collection afterwards to see if there was a, a reduction in odor or an increase in odor at that point um, and if there's any data to share that way and that's it perfect for you uh, Brad, it's uh, Brett McRae here. Uh, um, yeah, th thanks for the question. Uh, what I would say, I mean, we've had some, uh, I've had some conversations uh, about, you know, and the, but they've been anecdotal, obviously, in the United States, where um, um, it's not unusual for uh, uh, um, individual states, environmental protection agencies, to actually uh, 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 recommend the approach that uh, that we're taking as far as the entombment of, uh, of old cells. Uh, now, as far as uh, uh, measurement uh, of, of, of the smell or quantification, that's a tricky one. And, and you know, Sean Hamilton, uh, Sean's first comment uh, it, it was accurate. The, the best way to measure it is with your nose. Um, there, there, as far as I'm aware, there's no sm smell -a meter uh, that, that we could deploy. So we really have to rely on the residents and uh, on our own noses and, and common sense on uh, 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 the intensity and and the sources. Um, the, the only uh, the one thing I will add because I I, I, I didn't get a chance to with uh, Jermaine's uh, uh, questions um, is the uh, contact information. Uh, Vladimir had, uh, had asked uh, how to contact us to report an odor. 
Um, as far as phone number, um, the best number is 453-9938. That's our uh, hotline number. And uh, the other option, uh, and this uh, uh, is probably the more effective option uh, during uh, uh, COVID, will be our uh, email address. It's uh, info, I-N-F-O, at F-R-S-W-C. So that's Frank Roger Sam Walter Charlie dot C-A. All right, perfect. Thank you, Brad. So next it will be Gail Costello. So I'll ask that you unmute yourself state and state your name and address for the record, please. Hi there, my name is Gail Costello and I live in the Lincoln Heights subdivision as well, 1470 Lincoln Road. Um, first of all, thank you for this presentation. I, uh, I signed up and uh, wanted to watch this more from an educational point of view. Um, I, I wanted to learn more about what was happening. Uh, I am undecided and, and I like to learn both sides of the, I guess, coin or the story before I make up my mind. Um, a couple of things that I saw in the presentation and heard were things like, you know, the, the, the change in atmospheric pressure is negligible. It's only 6%. It shouldn't affect the odor. Um, the height shouldn't be seen by neighbors. I'm not sure if that's convincing. The shouldn't be, you know, it, it sounds kind of like a maybe ambiguous. Um, you can always smell the dump. I've, I've lived here about 30 years. And to tell you the truth, I, I never ever complained. I, I just assumed it's a dump, it's a landfill. It does smell, that's the way it is. And I'm not sure if only, you know, sort of saying that there's been no official complaints since 2016, I don't think that means that there, there isn't any smell. And one, you know, you've said comments about if you do smell anything to call you and you will come and, and check it out um, and then make changes or see what you can do about it. So my, one of my questions is if you, what are those changes? What, what can you do? And why wouldn't you be proactive um, knowing obviously that a landfill does smell rather than wait for people to make complaints? Is it, you know, what are, what can you do? If there are things you can do, why wouldn't you automatically do that? Um, anyway, those are, those are just my thoughts that have come up as I've, as I've listened. And uh, once again, thank you. It's been very informative. Perfect. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, um, Gail, I, I appreciate the comments. Uh, what, what I would say, uh, um, when we talk about uh, odor complaints, uh, I, I, I just want to give, give you some background. So I, I, I've been with the, the uh, um, Fredericton Region Solid Waste for uh, 18 years, and, and that's long enough to recall when we used to receive a steady stream of odor complaints, uh, and we could smell it. I mean, uh, even the, the people that work there, I mean, it's like working at a farm. Um, after a while, sometimes you stop being able to smell it. I worked there at a time when you could smell it and you, and you could be there every day and you could smell it. Um, so the first step that we put in place is obviously our, our, our gas collection uh, and destruction uh, program. That was phase one. And uh, that involved flaring of the, uh, the uh, uh, gas. Next step. Uh, uh, and, and it was sort of what you would call a retrofit of, uh, of the existing landfill. So that was the, uh, you know, we, we installed uh, a series of vertical wells, some shallow horizontals uh, uh, with uh, marginal collection efficiency, but it was the best we could do with the existing waste mass. And uh, then going forward from that period, so about 2006, 2007 on, we started uh, uh, installing uh, integrated uh, gas collection piping, which eventually gets supplemented by additional vertical wells that are installed. And uh, so that further increases the uh, collection efficiency. We then started to apply uh, uh, final cover and caps, uh, which uh, reduces the amount of fugitive gas that can escape. And, and the reason, uh, what I'm getting at here is that we're, we're always working to, to, to improve our system. 
uh, and it will get better as as uh, as the gas production curve, which I, I often refer to. I'm sure most people aren't familiar with it, but with landfill gas production, uh, uh, it's typically it's about a bell bell shaped curve uh, with peak production about 15 years out, and so uh, we would expect a significant improvement with a basically a fully covered modern system about 15 years uh, um, after the implementation of the original gas collection system. When I ask people to let us know when it, uh, if there's an odor issue, um, and, and you ask, well, why wouldn't you just do it? Why wouldn't you take all the measures anyway? We do try to, uh, we're careful with how we spend the public's money. And if we feel that we've got a system that's adequately, adequately addressing the problem, then it would be irresponsible to, to add supplementary costs to a, to a system that, we, that appears to be operating efficiently. Um, that's, that, that, and that, that's what we're getting at. If, if it turns out that, it, that there's something additionally that we can do, if there's some correlation between uh, uh, weather events with, with waste types that we're accepting, uh, if we get a timely complaint and we're able to correlate that with, for example, a, uh, a load of old lobster, I mean, this is, it doesn't sound appealing, but this is, this is the business. Um, we may be able to better address uh, maybe the disposal area or the covering procedure associated with it. And so that's what I'm getting at when I talk about uh, uh, real complaints. Um, we may be able to correlate it with a specific event that we're able to address in a timely manner. Perfect. Thank you, Brett. Uh, there are no other people in line to speak, so I'm just going to ask once for comments and then a second time for comments. All right. Um, we've had, we have individuals who've spoken before that have raised their hands. I'm going to leave that to Brett to decide what he wants to do on that. We have a rule that everyone can speak once, so it's up to Brett. Or Brett, sorry. It's up to Brett. Maybe, uh, Isabel, maybe I'll, I'll yeah. weigh in on that. Uh, sure. Let's give uh, folks who wish to speak again uh, an additional two minutes. And okay. I would ask that you uh, not repeat a point that you've previously made. Uh, because we, we have a record of that that'll be part of our uh, uh, of the process, but uh, looking for uh, new points. Thank you. Perfect. And on Don's point of that, I will let Don speak. I'm going to ask that you unmute yourself and please stick to new points. Okay, good to go. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, so I think this is a new point. Uh, three minutes was quite a bit of a blur there. I think, in my opinion and in experience, you need to redo the public involvement process and include more people. The only reason why you got people from Lincoln Heights is because of me, and uh, quite it's as simple as that. So people are busy. It's, it's a time of year when we're thinking about COVID, people are dealing with kids, et cetera, et cetera. But I know for sure that the landfill does smell. I know what it smells like. It's not anyone else. And other people are aware of it as well. So if it takes phone calls to change something to make it a better way of life here in Lincoln, I will certainly be calling. Now, I tried to call a few times to not complain, but just to see when you guys were open. And the phone number that I had, no one picked up. So I'm, I'm just saying that. But uh, I'll email from, from now on. And when I'm going out for a walk at eight o'clock at night and I smell it, I'll email you. So, so anyway, I just didn't think that there was any more that could be done. And I know other community members believe the same thing. So uh, I'll make sure that the community is aware that the email address is there and if they smell it to send in an email, but you need to do a more robust second phase of your public involvement program to be fair to the community. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Sean. 
So we're going to have Vladimir speak. I'm going to ask that you unmute yourself. And if you have two minutes, please uh, say any new points that you may have. So you're currently muted. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. There we go. Um, uh, just a quick one. Sorry, I didn't catch the second part of the email. If you could please repeat that one. It just prefer to spell it alphabetically as you need. Thanks. Thank you. Sure, Vladimir, the, uh, uh, the email, I'll, I'll give it to you in its entirety again. It's uh, info at F as in Frank, R as in Roger, S as in Sam, W as in Walter, C as in Charlie, dot CA. So frswc.ca. All right, thank you, Brett. And next we have Jermaine Pataki Teru. You have two minutes. I'm gonna ask um, that you unmute yourself and only state new points, please. Thank you, Ash. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the very large ad in the Gleaner um, announcing this public participation opportunity. And um, the fact that you know, people are saying that there wasn't enough opportunity maybe to uh, to give input, but I mean, that was clearly a, a wonderful invitation. And um, I think the, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the documents are all very accessible and it's, it's good to be able to have opportunity and to have access to read these things. So thank you for that. That's all. Perfect, thank you, Jermaine. All right. There are no other individuals with their hands raised. So I'm going to give it a second or two. Everyone's making up their mind. All right. So the floor session is closed. Oops, went too far. You can email or snail mail any further comments you might have. You can see on the screen there's Marco's email at Gemtech, and there's also Gemtech's. Um, Telephone number, sorry, no, sna no snail mail, only email. All right, I'm just gonna give everyone a minute or two to take down any of that information. And I would also like everyone for coming out. The session is now done.